Welcome to Film Interchange this evening. I'm Jen Mello, your hostess. La 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 la. Yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> so I'm very, very excited to have the discussion that we're having this evening um, because it's, it's not just about directing or producing or screenwriting as we've chatted about many times, but it's also about um, international co-productions and distribution and a little bit of, you know, um, budgeting and how to keep costs down. We're gonna, we're gonna cover a little bit of everything. Um, and our speaker this evening is Vlad Nikolic. Come on up. Yeah. So excited to have you join us as a thought leader. Thank you. You're very welcome, you're very welcome. Um, are you comfy? That's the um, first question. Yeah. Yeah, getting there. I hope I'm not gonna fall off. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, a little, it's a little high, it's a little high. Um, so welcome. I'm really Thank looking you. forward to chatting with you this evening. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, hold on. I gotta turn this the other way. Boop a doop. It's not happening. Okay. Here we go. So first of all, I'm interested to hear where you come from and how you got to New York. Um, okay, I'll try the short version. Yeah, the short uh, version. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, uh, I was born in what was a country called Yugoslavia. It doesn't exist anymore. Now it's called Serbia. But I grew up actually in Germany. And then I went back to um, Yugoslavia. I um, did many things there. started filmmaking there. And then I came to New York first time actually in 1990. And spent here a year. And then I went back. And I was working for This was the first independent film um, TV station actually uh, that opened in Belgrade. And then, you know, the whole place started to kind of fall apart and then I came back to New York and okay. kind of I just stayed here you know since then yeah. um, never had actually the idea that I'm going to stay here for so long but things turned out that way and I actually like that it turned out that way yeah good fit for you mm. yeah um, I mean there's tons to do in New York film wise well it's also you know for me it's a city that totally works for people who you know because I, I'm kind of uh, you know uh, I don't belong to a place you know and I think New York is a perfect place for people who don't have a place, you know, because uh, I think it's the city where you don't feel as a foreigner or a stranger, you know, so yeah. so that's, I think, really everybody's great. from somewhere exactly, else. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Exactly. So what got you interested in filmmaking from the onset? Um, well, I actually was first a musician, and then um, I... Oh, yeah, me too. Yeah, we yeah, just see, had that discussion. I think there's yeah. a lot of, you know, connections between music, and I was also doing, like, drawing, painting, and all that, and, you know, film initially for me was something that was looking up to I thought um, that's too you know like wow amazing to do that but then it kind of came all together and actually studied first for a cinematographer so I, my actual first you know I was a DP and cinematographer and then I started writing scripts I got some awards and I started directing and so I've done actually everything but you know now I'm mostly a producer director okay okay mm. so mostly a producer director mm. but you still write and I write, yeah. No, I'm uh, writing my own stuff. Um, I direct sometimes. I used to also edit. I don't do this for other films anymore, but, you know, I edit a lot of my own stuff. So, yeah. yeah. So. Uh, well, I just think it's so interesting in the, in the indie film space that we can wear so many hats, mm -hmm. but also then we tend to wear all those hats and it can get yeah. exhausting. Do you ever find yourself having trouble deciding which project to go after under which hat or does it just sort of come together organically? Well, you know, my own s projects, I usually, it's, it's just kind of, it happened like this, you know, because I started as a cinematographer, um, and then basically I switched into directing, but, you know, then I started editing my own stuff, I mean, this was a time we were still cutting on film and all that, um, and because I couldn't afford to pay, you know, people who were really good, uh, and this is always the, the, the case, you know, if you work low budget, right, you have to, you know, you have to learn everything, and I think it's a good thing, you know, the only problem you have is, you know, this is the old joke. Of course, if you, if you work on a union movie, they always can tell that you're an independent, you know, director because you start moving the lights, you know, so. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. <laughs> That's so cool. Um, so is there one hat that you wear in the film space that you think really is, like, this is the one? Is it, you know, producing or is it directing or it really just kind of all melts together for you? Well, I always thought, actually, as a producer, you know, because it's actually, this is just because of the way my career went because, you know, I was uh, started, you know, working in, you know, the more the industry where you can just do one thing. But once I started doing independent films, you know, and then I, I started thinking about, you know, you start thinking about the money, the budget, everything. So mm -hmm. I, I kind of, it's hard to distinguish for me to the producing, directing. Uh, and then I started producing other people's films, which is, a, that was a new experience for me because, you know, I mean, as a filmmaker, you always think the producer is to blame for everything, right? right. But then, you know, when you're on the other side, you Wait see it's really, it's really complicated. The producer's yeah. not to blame? 
um, sometimes kidding, sometimes they are sometimes Don't they are yeah <laughs> but no I think it's really you know you realize that's really you know I mean at least if you if you work with really great people you know how, how important it is actually to have a really good producer yes mm. absolutely um, have you seen any of the project green light this year um, I, I saw that was like way back you know when they had the first I think season but okay, I haven't cool. watched anything uh, yeah the it's if you guys haven't seen the project green light this season do check it out because the, the producer is kind of the rising star mm -hmm. of this particular season um, in that she just mm -hmm. kicks butt anyway <laughs> it's she's a good example yeah. of a producer doing everything okay so I think it's really interesting um, that you tend to focus on international co-productions, and that seems to be where things are, are going with you. Not that you've done it across the board, but that it's that it's mm. something that you are doing. So, how do you start to you know reach out to another production company in another country? How does that? conversation begin um, well you know I, I don't I mean I would say that if you it's very different again we're talking about independent film because there is no one model to follow sure. you know I think every film is different and it and then the time really changes you know so the, the it, it depends on the project it depends on um, you know usually the way to work this is that if there are some kind of foreign elements attached so um, usually, you know, as you probably know, there is um, the way films are funded in, in Europe and other countries is very different. You know, it's not commercial, it's usually yeah, government funded. Mm -hmm. But in order to get that type of money, you have to have some essential element in the film, which is usually a writer or a director. So if you're both that, you know, and, you know, like uh, a friend of mine who's a you know, European producer says, and you always ask people, do you have a foreign passport, first thing, uh, so you can apply for these grants. But if not, you know, then you can maybe shoot somewhere or you can find other ways in which you... Um, can you know get some funds from another country? Um, the thing is, though, that you know it's become more complicated. You know, it's become more difficult. You know, in terms of uh, because because there's many 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 films being made. There's less and less money in general. So you know, you have to be very specific. I think uh, what kind of um, you know collaborations you can you can make and how you know. So it's again much easier if you have like for example, if I'm producing, and if the director writer director is from let's say Germany or you know. Uh, another country like that, then it's much easier because then you can qualify for their funds and then you can do other types of But it's much harder if you want to, let's say, shoot in New York. If the writer director is from the US, then, then you know, it's very hard you know, to um, actually make this happen. So meaning that if you were to do a film in collaboration with uh, let's example a German production company right. filming in New York would be difficult but if you were to film yeah, well, in it, Germany it, you have to have some kind of you know usually they give you the money like for example if you film in Germany they will give you certain money based on the money you spend there you sure. know right, right, right. but they do have funds which are similar to grants right that but they usually give them only to you know filmmakers who are from that country mm -hmm. uh, so in other words if you for example have a writer that's maybe you know I don't know, Canadian and who has written the script, uh, because then you qualify, then you can qualify for Canadian film funds, you know. I mean, we just went actually last year for a film that I'm producing, I'm not directing it, and we were looking into shooting it in, in Canada, and because the writers and directors are from the US, the, you know, the, there was no funds available to us, but there are some incentives they give, like if you shoot in certain areas, sure. um, you know, then, and you spend some money, then you get some more money. Mm -hmm. So you, can, you have to, it's complicated, and you have to kind of, you know, put all these little pieces of the puzzle together. Um, so, but I think it's worthwhile because you know, there's still ways that you can, you know, put a, you know, larger, I mean, larger for independent films, yeah. bigger budget, you know, which is nothing compared to Hollywood, but still, uh, together if you, if you, and, and it's also good because I think it has a more global reach altogether, you know, for the film. Sure, absolutely. And, and Canada is actually a great example of a mm. country that has great tax incentives right. and, and they really do well to work with yeah. um, anybody, not just mm -hmm. Americans, but they, they do mm -hmm. well. Do you ever pay attention to, um, specific foreign markets in, like from a from a financial standpoint to kind of check into maybe maybe there's a story there or is that ever a consideration I don't think you know I mean the way I look at it and you know other people might disagree with this but I think it's like unless you have a big star that doesn't play you know so it's basically you go out to you know, I think every film like you know uh, I know you know that you know I've worked with Jim Stark, a producer who's been doing this for 30 years, and yep. who started with Jim Jarmusch and Greg Araki and all these filmmakers. And we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, yeah, but you know, like uh, I'm saying this because he, I usually quote him where he says, you know, every independent film is a DIY effort, and it's kind of you make it and then you figure out what to do with it. You know, so it's like you figure out where you're going to get the money, then you make it, and actually the making, although it's difficult, is actually maybe the easiest part in some ways. You know, because that 
you know what you're doing. But then, you know, in, uh, in terms of selling, in terms of financing, it's a huge risk because it's there is never any guarantee. And I think, you know, it used to be like in the maybe until 10 years ago, definitely before the financial crash, that you know, the, you, the foreign market was you know, open to American independence, but that's also become much more difficult. So I think you know, to count on these things, I mean, I, you know, it's not that I would be pessimistic about it. I think you know, one should make films, but there are new ways in which one could look into financing, distribution. And I think this old model of you know, pre-sales, foreign sales, window to distributions, and so on, which you know, a lot of people are now talking about, for independent film has become almost unworkable. It's a good model when you're starting out to do your first and second film, but then after that, you know, it's kind of, you can't really, you know, uh, you know, we look at this, if you look at all those producers and filmmakers from the 90s, like, you know, the famous New York producers like Ted Hope or, you know, James Seamus and so on, so they all kind of moved on to different things because that model is not something that works really well as a business model, you know. Uh, so that doesn't mean you shouldn't do films. I think it's the great thing is that because of the technology, you can make films for much less money. So the risk is, you know, much smaller, which I think is a great thing. And your iPhone. Right. Tangerine. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Tangerine. You know, so, uh, so that's a perfect example, you know, and I think that's the really, really great thing. So if you have an interesting story, you can, you know, you kind of have some interesting angle to it. And I don't think you have to think that far, you know, because you can make a film for whatever, you know, five, ten thousand yeah. dollars. You know, so that I think is is is, is a huge, huge, uh, great thing for independence. Yeah, great. Well, it, that begs the question: if that's a good model for your first or second film, but it doesn't really work in the long run, what are some alternatives? Like, what's a model that would work better down the line, or is is that too? I mean, it's a large question. It's that's a, large a big question. question. Yeah, I mean, you know, if I was twenty, I would be on the internet now. That's where things are. You know, it's a different form, and of course, I'm not saying it's the same thing. But if you look at, I don't know, you know, some of these uh, filmmakers like Freddie Wong, I like his, you know, I don't know if you know his channel, right? He has millions of followers. Yeah. He just signed a deal with with Lionsgate, you know. But you know, he has started online, you know, and this is a, a space where you can have your following, you can have your audience and then you can transition to you know or web series like you know high maintenance for example that got picked up by HBO you know but they did these series for like you know less than a thousand dollars per per show so I think these are the models that I would be looking into rather than going the old way of you know uh, like trying to raise like a million two million dollars then you know doing foreign pre-sales because it takes much longer and I think there is no guarantee that that's gonna work in terms of distribution I mean even if you get into a festival you know it's, it's getting really hard to get you know the type of distribution that you used to get with you know these type of independent films. That's solid advice. That's really good. And maybe maybe even you could build up your following and do your whole proof of concept film on YouTube just to yeah. say that you could do it. And then and I say you know I always like uh, you know people say well you know as I said you know certain genres will work better. Of course, if you have comedy, if you have sci-fi, if you have horror and these type yeah, of uh, things. But you know there are films. There are like you know uh, I always like to to mention for example Shane Carruth who is the filmmaker who did Primer. Um, and then he did uh, Upstream Color, you know, after 10 years, you know, I mean, he won Sundance, is like kind of a cult following. And after 10 years of trying to make a film in Hollywood, he realized, you know, nobody really is, is interested in making the types of films that he wants to do, because they're, you know, different. Um, so then he went and did Upstream Color. And, you know, she shot it on a small, you know, Panasonic GH3, you know, DSLR camcorder, acted, edited, directed, distributed it. And, you know, it was a success story. And now he's doing a couple million dollar movies. So, you know, I think there are these models. I think just, you know, like with everybody in filmmaking, if you really care about what you're doing, you have to be a fanatic. There's no way around that. Yeah, yeah. you have to be a fanatic and you got to get creative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Which and finding ways, you know, and I think this is where a producer can come in really, especially if you're doing your first and second film, because I think they're very, very, they're, there's you know, a lot of people who are super talented, but maybe they don't understand the business or the industry that well in terms of what they can do and how to do it. Uh -huh. So if you have a producer who has experience, you know, who can guide you through that process, mm -hmm. I think that's very helpful for, you know, beginning filmmakers. Awesome, really cool. So as we mentioned, you, have worked with Jim Stark. For those who don't know who Jim Stark is, can you explain a little bit about who he is and yeah. how you started working with him? Um, he's uh, you know, one of those, like there's these, these few very well-known New York producers from the 80s, 90s and onwards who have, you know, so he's, he usually, he started with Jim Jarmusch actually, his first three films and then he produced the early Greg Araki movies and a bunch of other, you know, independent films. He has like, I don't even know, like 30, 40, 50 features to his credit. <laughs> Um, and it was very interesting, you know, so when I came here, um, first in New York, I had an agent and everything, 
and I was, you know, I wanted to do my big American movie. Um, and then, you know, I kind of, got, this is why I went back, because after a year I realized that it's like whatever you do somewhere else doesn't translate here, you know, and you need to kind of start from the beginning. And there was another thing, you know, which was kind of all the producers, and, you know, I met like a lot of the bigger companies and agents and so on. Everybody's always talking about, you know, how much does a film cost, who's in it? but not what the film is about, which to me was like kind of a new experience, you know. Um, and then I had some shorts that won some awards and so on. At that time, um, there was uh, someone at the Lincoln Center who was the uh, director of the Lincoln Center Film Program. His name is Richard Pena. He recently retired, but, you know, so we had lunch, and I would, you know, ask him, aren't there any normal producers here? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and then he said, well, there's two. And there's James Seamus and Jim Stark, you know, and I didn't know anybody at that time, and so I called uh, Seamus and they were just doing actually Ang Lee's first movie, it was The Wedding Banquet. Mm -hmm. And then I called Jim, you know, and I said, hey, you know, I'm so-and-so, I have, you know, a script, I have my reel. And he said, okay, you know, give me your reel, give me your script, I gave him, you know, both. And then he called me back and he said, okay, I hated your script, I think it's awful. I love your reel though, you know, I think you're really, really great. So if you want to do something else, and this was, nobody has ever talked to me like that, you know, and I thought this is refreshing. Yeah. And this is kind of, you know, uh, the, because he's an old school type of producer, you know, and this is how we then started kind of talking about film. And it took us 10 years to actually, which was, he produced my second feature, which was Love. Uh, and at that same time, he was um, actually producing uh, or putting money together for a film called Factorum, with, uh, which is based on Charles Bukowski with Matt Dillon. So as he was kind of you know raising money for that film, then he was also raising f uh, money for my film Love, which was very funny. So he was like talking to all these big, actually very big companies like Italian, German, French, and says, "Okay, so we have Factor and Matt Dillon and Marissa Tomei, and, so, and there's this little movie. Give us like fifteen thousand bucks, you know." Ah. So, and so ah. we actually you know put the money together, which is amazing, you know, like which is an international co-production, very small budget, uh, but we did the film, went to Venice. You know, Tribeca, a bunch of other festivals, is very successful, and you know, so I've known him for 20 years, and it's yeah. very unusual, you know, because the first one we did, we didn't have a contract, we just did a handshake and said, yeah, okay, let's do this, you know, so it's like kind of, this is, this is kind of old school, that's what I'm saying, it's like you don't really work like that anymore, you know. Yeah, I love that, but I, there were two really solid gems that just popped out of that for me, which was, number one, he made a phone call, which I think is so awesome so many people do not pick up a phone in this day and age and when you do you tend to get results not always but i, I think it's a, a faster and cleaner way to communicate um, especially now because people are not used to it um and then there was a second one which was the producer for, so for the producers in the room um jim had two films that he was kind of you know, getting out into the world. And it was easy to talk about the second one because mm -hmm. he was talking about the first one and it just was a streamlined conversation and that's how your film got mm -hmm. made. Right. Awesome, very cool stuff. So keep it in mind, write it down, write, it, write all your notes. Um, so, great transition. We're gonna take a look at Love, your film Love. Okay. Um, so we can, we can turn around, we can stay. And now, ladies and gentlemen, music you've never heard before. The one and only Skip.
Okay, so <laughs> that's that's an intense moment. So what's happening in that scene? Um, this is basically, it's actually really funny. I, I didn't even think when you asked me, but because this performer, his name is Skip, uh, and he's kind of, you know, pretty well known in the underground New York scene. And I just did a music video with him this weekend. He has his oh, new album awesome. out, you know, yeah, but he has huge hair. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so the scene is basically this is a nightclub where kind of all the this is, um, all the main characters kind of get together. So and this is just kind of a in between music. Uh, just in a fun scene. little moment. Yeah, mm -hmm. Awesome. That was mm -hmm. that was cool. So this got a lot of. Well, first of all, where can we all watch Love? Where is it at this point? Um, it's out. You know, it's, this is actually it came out two thousand. And seven, it's 2005. Yep. Actually, was the premiere. So it's on on on. Uh, I mean, it's on Netflix DVD. It's, it was on streaming. It's not on streaming right now. But it's a, uh, you know, out Amazon, Netflix. So you know, all Great. those. Great, Amazon places. and Netflix. Mm -hmm. Cool. Check it out. Um, so, you got a nice festival run with this film, mm -hmm. uh, including Venice, Tribeca, Barcelona, Geneva, um, and others. How did how did you go about choosing which festivals to submit it to? Well, you know, I mean, you usually try the big ones first, <laughs> which is, you know, so we tried Sundance, we didn't get in, um, and then that was, I think, you know, usually you go by the dates also, you know, mm -hmm. so the film was ready, I think it was the winter 2005, 2004 to 2005, and then the, we uh, showed it to Tribeca, and they liked it, and why Tribeca, um, because this was, I think, their second or third year. Um, and because the film happens in New York and it's about immigrants in New York and it has this kind of you know noir type of story of different characters from different countries but it has really plays to the New York setting um, and we thought maybe they'll like it and they liked it you know they really did so they programmed it you know we got a you know really fantastic premiere it was like full house like a thousand people that were still in Battery Park mm -hmm. and then you know um, so that was the world premiere and then for the international premiere um, we had these um, Italian co-producers so they um, talked to, they showed the film to the Venice programmer and he liked it um, and so then we played at Venice which was huge you know and then after that you know after you play in a big festival like that then you get invited to a lot to of other, other yeah ones. yeah mm -hmm. that's awesome and what do you think it it did for you um that being that was your second it was feature the second film? feature yeah. yeah well I mean it did open you know some doors um we did distribute so then we did you know theatrical small theatrical distribution here um, we also, the, the DVD got released by, at that time it was, um, uh, what are they called, uh, they were Fox Lorber, now it's Koch Lorber, uh, which is, you know, major distributor of, of independent and art house films, and, you know, Sundance TV bought it, and, you know, about, I think about a dozen other countries, great. which was great, you know, so, yeah. uh, so that was perfect. Now, what I thought is, you know, now, of course, someone's going to write a big check and just going to make my next movie. Right, that's uh, how it works. But that doesn't <laughs> really happen, you know. So, and I think this is kind of the interesting story because it's, I think, that a lot of filmmakers have the same experience. And this is that you expect that, you know, then things will happen right away with the next one. And they don't, you know. So you have to kind of really, um, and you have to be ready with your next film, you know. That's also, you know, so you have to use that moment, you know, mm -hmm. because you get, obviously, publicity. You meet a lot of people and it's a good moment to then do your next film. So, yeah. you know, so what it did is basically just opened a few more doors, you know, met a few more people and opened more opportunities. And it opened more opportunities, mm -hmm. which great. Yeah. That's, that's what it's all yeah, about. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Meeting the right people, yeah. talking mm -hmm. to the right people. That's how, it, how it's done. And then you, you call them. All right. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> awesome. So now we're going to take a look at a second film of Zenith. Do you want to set it up a little bit before we move on to it? Um, okay, so this is, um, this is a, uh, we officially built this as a retro-futuristic steampunk thriller. And this is a crazy That's movie. That's a genre. This is a crazy yeah. movie, totally. So it's a mind-bending, dystopian film, and uh, what we'll see now is the trailer for the film, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about it. It's a very, it's really an unusual film. So people either love it or hate it. It's kind of split in the middle uh, because it's very unusual. 
Fantastic. Great. Zenith. That's me, Jack. Or dumb Jack, if you will. And this is the story. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this has a really interesting story about how you screened at South by Southwest, and um, you know what? I'm not even going to get into it. It's, um, why don't you explain what happened with that? So this is a film that um, it's actually quite a quite a you know pet trip because I wrote this out in like 2001, I think, and um, it is about these stories like that. Half of the story happens in the future, half of it uh, happens now. And it's basically a son in the future who finds his father's tapes uh, that he left behind, who um, is obsessed with a conspiracy that is, might be real or not. And so the film in itself, and this was from the beginning, the idea that the film, you know, actually, you can watch the film itself, but it also the story extends be beyond the film. And so initially I thought, you know, we would leave some, you know, VHS tapes and so on, you know, it was 2001. Uh, <laughs> but then it was actually good that it didn't happen for a long time. Why it didn't happen, which is interesting, and this is, I had many experiences like this, is because the film got optioned by a producer in a bigger company. And then, you know, it got optioned, I think, five or six times total over the period of eight years. Um, and which is really interesting, you know, in terms of, because initially I wanted to do it, you know, kind of down and dirty, underground, you know, $100,000, $200,000, let's just do it. Um, but then it got option, and so the, 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 the budgets for the film varied from like 200,000, which was the initial, to like 8 million at one point, uh, and back, and so on. And then finally, you know, all the options expired for a variety of reasons that, you know, with all the different producers didn't happen. And then we did it the way I thought we would do it, but actually it was good that we did it in 2009 and 10, because it was, you know, the internet and, you know, social media and all that. So we used that as a way of um, not only marketing the film, but extending the story beyond, you know, what the film itself is. Um, so this is why we used, and one of the things that, you know, actually many things were interesting about this film because we really did the whole marketing in a very different way than what, you know, at that time was usual for films, which means that we didn't really play festivals. We did some later, but we released these little tapes that, uh, through the internet and started, you know, marketing it through social media as this, you know, big conspiracy with, you know, different bloggers and people supporting it. And then we got also a bit lucky because, you know, the idea of a film by Anonymous is like, you know, because this conspiracy idea and so on. So usually when you have a book that someone writes that they don't want to put their name in this, it's by Anonymous. But then what happened, you know, which we didn't have anything to do with it, was 2010 and 11, the hacker group Anonymous came out, you know, became big. And all of a sudden everybody thought it's their movie, which we, <laughs> we said it's not, you know, but because it had this whole thing about conspiracy and it was all over the web and so on. So it got a lot of interest, you know, and traction, so that then we did these like you know secret premiere, which was at the IFC Center in in, in uh, on Sixth Avenue, and midnight only. And we had for the premiere we had lines around the block, you know we had we had like sold out theater, you know, um, and we were showing it for, you know, while only in midnights um, because the idea was that you know so people who were already familiar with the story and so on, uh, but there was a very limited amount of them could see it, and we got a lot of press of the stuff what we were doing because it was, it was very unusual. And then, you know, we teamed up actually with a company that, you know, uh, the, that Hollywood doesn't like that much, which is BitTorrent. <coughs> and uh, <laughs> we basically, you know, there was this website called vodo.net, 
And so our distributor, actually the, the guy who was doing the distribution, you know, talked to them and I said this would be great if they released, you know, just a part of the film for free, you know. And uh, they had this program then that basically they released the part of the film for free and then people can contribute. So it's kind of like Kickstarter now. Kickstarter didn't exist yet, mm -hmm. but in reverse. So, you know, you get the first 30 minutes free, but give us money and we're going to give you the next 30 minutes. Um, and they premiered this at South by Southwest. Um, and this was the interesting thing is because, you know, we, we said, well, you know, we will do this, but, you know, they really have to stand behind the film. You know, they, they really have to promote it. And they did. And I wasn't at South by Southwest. I was traveling and I was checking, you know, uh, because the first 30 minutes went up. Um, and it was whatever, you know, Monday evening. And I said, oh, it's up, you know, and I, Tuesday I checked, there were 1.5 million downloads. So this was something that, I was shocked, you know, I mean, I did expect yeah. something like this, but not, you know, I thought maybe 10,000 would be fantastic. Um, the next day, I actually got into, you know, some trouble with my uh, investors because the Pirate Bay had this, you know, our logo on their, you know, web, you know, front page. And I was like, this, it, it was amazing. It was spun out of control, you know, but it was the first 30 minutes of the film. Now, of course, did we make billions of dollars? We didn't, you know, because yeah. the this was the interesting thing is that, you know, uh, what I learned through this, because eventually the film came out the you know, regular way with you know, iTunes, Netflix, Hulu, and all that stuff. Uh, but the, these two markets don't overlap, you know, so it's kind of, you know, people take stuff from free uh, or they, you know, buy it the regular way. So we got an incredible marketing, you know, and promotion through these means. And it was a really interesting experience also in terms of how you can use these different forms that, you know, that we have now at your disposal. Um, but basically, in my view, what this is, it's really for marketing because, you know, pirating movies and, you know, I'm not an advocate for that, but it's like it's one thing, you know, for Hollywood or for people stealing films and just like, you know, um, for their own gain. But for independence, I think it's something that you can actually use to market a film, you know, and since then this has been done with, you know, some documentaries, the Yes Men have done this and a bunch of others where they actually deliberately, you know, because it builds up the, the presence of a film through, through uh, all these channels. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because it's like, as you mentioned, you did this pre-crowdfunding. Kickstarter didn't right. exist yet. And yet you used a very um, smart crowdfunding technique that, you know, I would think that Kickstarter probably looked to your film when they first were starting out because... Well, not, you know, it's actually, it's very interesting, you know, because I was like, when I did my first film, which was Burn, you know, right. which was shot in 96, and I used digital video, you know, and digital look camcorders, and then I did a lot of panels, you know, it, now it, it took us three years to finish the film, because at that time you still had to rent Avid to, you know, edit and so on, but, uh, you know, so in the meantime, there was all the Dogma movies, and Lars von Trier, and everybody came out with their DV movies, uh, but I, one of the, you know, there was a couple of us doing this stuff here, one, one of the other filmmakers, his name is Lance Veller, who did a film called The Last Broadcast, who's now doing, this is, this stuff is now called transmedia. This is usually what we call this, which means, you know, doing extending stories beyond just one medium onto multiple platforms. And Lance and I were doing these, these you know, panels where we we're talking about digital filmmaking, digital filmmaking and so on, you know, with the first generation of consumer camcorders. So, you know, fast forward 2010, I do Zenith and, you know, Lance is doing his uh, transmedia project at Sundance. And again, we meet each other talking about transmedia and these kind of new forms. And then the Kickstarter guys were actually two guys who were basically musicians. And the idea, you know, like how it came about was basically they thought it would be nice if we could get some money up front before we do the gig. So, you know, one of them was, you know, a programmer and I said, well, you know, let's just make a website, ask our friends and family and, you know. But to me, this is kind of like when I said, I really what, what, where all these leads to is like the DIY model, you know, just, you know, if you have individuals that have great ideas and they're very passionate about what they're doing and they push it through, you know, and it's, I, again, you know, again, my, idea or philosophy behind this is like look what's going on you know don't look back because media film all that changes very fast and there are really interesting things people are doing um, but you have to be on it because even you know so this was 2010 uh, 2011 and if you look at it now you know it's only five years ago but it's like everything has already changed you know oh, absolutely everything has changed mm -hmm. and um, you're right always look forward and see what's what's next what's next because mm -hmm the minute that you hop on the next bandwagon. I mean, logically, you know, I mean, I'm not advocating that one should do 
blindly, you know, but you can find the connection, what your film is about, what your project is about, who's your audience, how you, can you reach them, you know? So there sure. are now more means in which you can actually directly communicate with that audience, mm -hmm. you know, so you don't need to wait for someone to allow you to, you know, reach that audience. Right, right, right. And, but also, I think that's one of the hardest things, is finding your audience. How do you reach your audience? And I mean, obviously, you had a film about intrigue, so it sort of naturally mm -hmm. lent itself right. to creating intrigue, which was awesome. So, so maybe that's what your first topic should be, create something of intrigue and then just go from there um, but at the same time um, you know in today's market if we use different tools like Periscope just came out you guys all know Periscope yeah pretty crazy do you know Periscope mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, interesting stuff to see you know mm -hmm. like let's go live right now or, right. or whatever it is mm -hmm. um, use livestream.com Definitely use livestream.com. <laughs> absolutely um, so let's move on a little bit to um, to your teaching, because you, you do a lot of teaching. You're at the new school right now, but mm -hmm. that's not the only place in which you've taught. Mm -hmm. um, you were at NYU for mm -hmm. a little bit. Right. Where else did you teach? Uh, University of the Arts in Philadelphia. Okay. And uh, there was a place, they're cl close now, it's called Film Video Arts, uh, which was you know the big independent, like many, it was actually the biggest nonprofit you know, organization where you could take classes, rent equipment, um, 80s, 90s, you know, mm -hmm. and then like a lot of these other these places, they went out of business um, because of the real estate issue in New York. But that's where also where I used to teach. Awesome, very cool. Yeah. What got you into? Prof pr I can't say it. Pr professorship. Profes <laughs> Professorship. Professorship. I don't know why I was like, why can't I say this word? I do know. I do know the word. <laughs> I am Profes professorial, Tim. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to swivel my chair back in this direction. Thank you very much. Um, so, what what made you go this well, direction? It, it started, you know, it started just uh, again because you know I, I started as a cinematographer, so you know I, I knew how to take a camera apart and put it back together, you know, during the film times and all these other things. So I started teaching. You know, they invited me. Actually, first place I thought was film video arts and. Uh, I was teaching, you know, production classes, um, and then it turned out, you know, that I'm good at it. Pe you know, students liked it. I liked it too. You know, I really have like uh, my what my friends say for better or for worse a student film mentality, which means I care about the films. I don't talk about you know the money, although you have to. But mm -hmm. you know, so but I like that because it's a passionate thing. You know, I've been in this industry for a long time, um, and uh, you know, you see sometimes people who kind of you know burn out. You know, because if it's just about the money. Money can be great, but it's like they lose kind of the reason why you, you know. I mean, I've been, when I worked in television for a while, you know, I was like, also like, you know, it was great, but then at some point I'm like, it's not quite what I would like to do, you know. Mm -hmm. So you want to, if you can marry your passion project with it. So this is where it started, and then, you know, kind of I, I was teaching as an adjunct in all these places, which is, you know, you basically run from one to the other. Um, but, you know, it was a good compensator because before that, you know, mostly, of course, the bread and butter in the 90s was for most filmmakers, you know, commercials, music videos, those type of things, you know, you work on that and then occasionally you make a film when you when you put the money together and that market changed a lot in you know 2000 oh, onwards sure. and so on yeah. um, and you know it's like so it kind of shifted more and more towards teaching and then when they offered me to teach um, actually it was first half time which means that you get like a salary as a half time professor at the new school and that was already I was teaching by that time uh, almost a decade then I, you know, agreed to that. I also started, you know, with, with, with because I think, I don't know, I can't say this for sure, but I think I taught the first digital filmmaking class in 98 at the new school, you know, because at that time everybody was saying, what are you talking about, the digital film? Yeah. You know, this is two different things. What? Yeah, we, we've come a long way since then, you know, so that's also something, you know, I mean, uh, I like when, when you have, you know, these type of challenges and new things and you kind of, you know, um, so it, it kind of logically followed into, into what I'm teaching. Now I'm teaching, you know, transmedia, crossmedia, these type of things. Mm. Uh, um, you know, and, and things have changed a lot. I see this with students now. They're much more, of course, now we take a class. It's not about the equipment. It used to be like, you know, you have to take a film class to get access to the camera. But I th still think it's a good thing if you, just in terms of context and concept and what you can do with it, you know, I think if, if you are with a, you know, if you are within a good um, class or a good teacher, or a good concept, it's still there's still a benefit to that, you know. Sure, absolutely. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on transmedia and what that means to you? Um, as I said, it's basically what it means. The concept generally means that you're uh, telling a story across multiple media platforms. The idea behind this is that we are now in a, you know, the, it was came out that there's an MIT professor, his name is Henry Jenkins, who actually uh, coined that term as fan-based. Um, 
media production in relation to films like The Matrix and similar. Um, and uh, Frank Rose, who was the, the author for Wired magazine, wrote a great book. It's uh, about the art of immersion. And so th the basic point of this is that we're now overwhelmed by media. We're, we're 24 hours on. And that it plays less and less of a role what kind of platform we're using. You know, so you're watching a movie on a TV screen, what kind of screens you're interacting, your phone, your computer, and so on. So the idea is that a story can kind of follow all these, you know, so you're not constricted within one medium. Um, but And it can do this in various different ways. So one thing that Hollywood does, does this now, of course, all the time, this is usually done in these uh, marketing campaigns for like Batman or Hunger Games where they have you know this kind of immersion of these core fans before the, the film comes out. Which but there's brilliant. many, many yeah. other ways in which you can do this, you know. So yeah. uh, uh, there is a great series if you, the Lizzie Bennett Diaries, which is a web series, which is done, this is kind of a transmedia thing. Uh, hugely successful, very creative, uh, you know, so and just a bunch of other examples of that. Very cool, mm -hmm. very cool. Um, we're gonna open it up to Q&A for, for the time being. Anybody have any questions? Yes, Marzi. So when you uh, oh wait, hold on one second. Can you come up and speak into the microphone, please? I know, I keep forgetting about that. <laughs> yeah, you, got, you have to be articulate, and don't, when you speak, don't spell anything wrong. So when you said that you release parts of the film through blogs, mm -hmm. did the blogs know that they were just getting little parts of the film, or were you like, this is a short film, or this is a clip we found, or? Um, initially, they didn't know. I mean, the, the idea was basically that we start, because the story first starts with the story that is happening present day, you know, so these kind of snippets of these tapes, the conspiracy, and all that stuff. Um, we didn't pretend this is real, you know, you can kind of see this is, you know, actors doing stuff. But people didn't know, was it the film, was it the series, was it what, what's behind it, what's the whole concept behind it. And then once the film came out, so then it has a, you know, the, the context kind of grows because now you see the future and what happened later. And then after the film was over, we had other blogs where you can then kind of follow, you know, continue the story. Um, because of the film in itself, this is why I said people either like it or they, they hate it because it's kind of open-ended. In a way, I mean, it's ended, but some some people don't like that it kind of you can interpret the film in many different ways. But that was the idea, you know, so that actually you can then expand and look into other forms. Cool. Very cool. So when you approached the blog, were you like, "Here's this clip of something we're working on"? No, what we did is it's it's actually was huge. We 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 built about uh, 48 websites uh, and content intensive, like not oh. one page, but yeah, I had a you team of people. Them team of people working with, me, with us on that, uh, that created this world, you know, and they're what we call entry points where people can start the story. And then we partnered with, you know, different blogs that already had a following, you know, because the one point is like, if you make a film, right, if you're not, you know, a big, you know, you're not Marvel, so you don't, you know, how do you reach your audience to your question is, so you partner with somebody who has an audience. So we were just looking at who are the people who are doing this type of stuff. And we have to be a little careful because there's a lot of people who deal with conspiracies online that are a little crazy. <laughs> uh, so we had to stick with the more, you know, normal ones, but you know, we did. And so there was a, uh, some of these blogs, they really then engage their you know audiences their users already and they were like going into what is in it and so on and from there then it spreads so that was the initial the initial was kind of the and then we had you know several different websites kind of we created a whole world that was not really the movie it was kind of you know beyond the movie but kind of leads you into the film you know yeah. mm. Mm. awesome thank you thanks thank you marzi <laughs> it's our uh, it's our <laughs> hometown collaboration slut as she calls herself <laughs> yep that's correct she coined it herself I didn't that's not I didn't say that <laughs> well I just said it into the microphone which now everyone knows the whole world wide web collaboration slut okay so who else has a question Tim I feel one burning I can see it come on up use the microphone <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Fine. All right. I'll ask questions. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about directing and the director DP relationship. Since you were a DP initially, mm -hmm. um, how important is that relationship to you? And do you look at it differently than maybe a different director who doesn't have that experience would? Um, well, to me, this is kind of the most important part of the film. So this is why, you know, I work with usually with DPs that 
can execute what exactly what I have you know in mind um, because I know exactly what I want. So you know, it's I think it's different if you come from the acting or writing background, so you depend on a DP more in terms of the creation of the look. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, it's really you know. So I work usually the DPs I work with are friends, uh, and but if you look their own their work in other films is very different than when they work uh, with me because it's I have a very 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 specific uh, mm. look that I want always, and I know exactly how to get it. But I don't want to shoot the film because you know I want to focus on other things. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've noticed that you work with Vladimir. I'm gonna mess up yeah. his last name. Subotic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pretty good. That's oh, great. Thank you. That's great. Oh, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's my first time saying it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you've worked with him several times now. Mm -hmm. What is it about about that collaboration? Well, yeah, just a good communication, you know. Yeah. So it's a good good communication. But I also worked with others, you know, like on the, uh, which actually not the last film I did, but the last that got released, it's called Allure. I worked with another DP, Alex mm -hmm. Kostic, and you know, and it's interesting because all my DPs get written up in the Times and everywhere, yes. like they all get, my God, you know, seriously great uh, reviews, uh, and not to minimize, you know, I think they're, they're they're amazing, you know, but it's always very, you know, we're very 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 deliberate in terms of what they what they do and how you know they approach the shoot. So mm -hmm. that's that's mm -hmm. awesome. Um, and then from there, uh, what do you have coming up? Uh, well, I finished another film, which actually we shot in Greece, and it's kind of interesting. It's and it just premiered last month, yeah? Yeah, it premiered last month. It's called Burek, which is this food that is shared around the Mediterranean by all the countries that are around. Specifically, it's meat yeah. wrapped in dough. Right. There, oh, yeah, very okay. well yep. researched and informed. That's my job. <laughs> um, <laughs> so go on. So, so, yeah, it's another, you know, it's a completely international cast, um, and we shot last summer in Greece, and it has actually the backdrop of the political crisis, what's happening there now, but it's a comedy, you know, it's a comedy actually, and kind of a, hum we call it a humanistic comedy because it actually tries to uh, kind of show the ways in which we can, you know, to highlight the, the good things, you know, and as about people no matter where they're from or what kind of background yeah. they have and so on. Absolutely, yeah. Greece is getting a pretty bad rap right at the moment. Um, but yeah, actually, my, my family just went to Greece for the first time mm. this summer, and they came back and they said, Greek it, people are the nicest people on the great. planet. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, mm. yeah. Specifically, they said the reason that um, Greeks are broke is because they just never pay their taxes. <laughs> Everybody's happy with that. Well, yeah, who yeah. likes to pay taxes, right? <laughs> They're like, no, we're not going to pay this yeah. year. And the government's like, okay. So right. <laughs> it's kind of what happens. Yes. Come on, come on up, because I want everybody to have a microphone. You can't speak. Maybe you can just. I can dictate. Can it. I can dictate it if you want. I can dictate for you. No, completely fine. <laughs> You're welcome. How do you specifically work with actors? Right. Cool. How do you how do you work with actors? Well. You know, this was for me really a discovery process because of being coming from the cinematography aspect, actually, and I think a lot of uh, filmmakers who come out of the technical aspect, actually, they have problems working with actors. They, they, they know everything about the cameras, but, you know, that was a learning experience. Um, and what I've found the works the best, I think, in film is really very, very, very obviously different than the stage. And the casting is really 90% of your, of your work. If you cast well, uh, the actor will bring in more than, you, than I could ever, you know, even write or imagine, you know. Um, and then it's really uh, the way I work with the actors is to really get them to be the character, to understand the character and to be the character. So we don't focus really on the dialogue. Uh, some directors, you know, famously, you know, as David Mamet insists on every word has to be said the way he writes. Uh, to me, I work the opposite, where I don't care about the dialogue, I care about what, you know, what the, the feeling that comes across. Um, actually, the, the last film before Burek that I did, it's called Allure. And it's an interesting film where it's completely improvised. Um, and it's improvised based on true stories of five women, again, immigrants, as you can see, there's a recurring theme in my uh, films. Um, and it's based on true stories of five women who have come from five different countries. And I work, we actually, the way we work, which is to me phenomenal, because it's a very, very low budget movie. So it allowed us to work in that way, which is very unusual for film that we could, you know, shoot on and off. So we would basically, you know, just have these, these, these extensive biographies of these characters, who they are, where they come from, what's going on, and so on. And then what you see in the film is a very little piece of, of uh, the story, but it, the actors were, you know, it helped them really to completely be the character. And then we would go into every scene uh, without any dialogue written. So you just go, okay, this is the scene. What's gonna happen in this scene is, I don't know, you're gonna break up with your uh, boyfriend, but how this will happen, we don't know. 
and then it w they would just play the scene. So the idea behind that was, you know, uh, someone told me this once and I was really interested in how do you, can you make something that is as real as reality in a fiction film? Uh, and in the way that we, that the process works right, is so you go enter a room and you expect something to happen, but you don't know how it's gonna happen, right? So the, the way, and this is what a lot, a lot of directors, I think, usually tries to get lines and acting that's fresh. You know, because the way, the, I, I think the more you rehearse the lines, the more you, you know, you try the same thing over and over again, it becomes a little stale, you know, and I think there's that moment that you want to capture on camera um, that feels like this is real, this happened in this moment, you know, so um, it depends on the film, depends on the actors, but I usually try to kind of give them space, you know, and kind of just put them in a spot where they feel very comfortable and, you know, that they un understand and know what they're doing. Good. Yes, Marzi, you want to come up? <laughs> Her you may come up to each time, well, right? She's right there. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, follow-up question to that, which, oh, do you shoot that, the improv stuff, did you shoot it multicam or? Yeah, okay. yeah. two cameras, sometimes three. Mm. Cool. And then my other question is, again, about the, like, transmedia stuff. So if you're making an independent film, and you're also, because social media is so huge now, so you're also trying to be active on social media, but then some festivals like don't want you to share anything and some distributors don't want mm -hmm. you to share anything. What, how weary are you of that when doing your social media campaign? Do you try to stay within the guidelines or kind of with, when you did the torrent, you're like, fuck it, they'll like it if they like it and they'll find us? Well, I mean, you don't have to show your actual film. You can you know, shoot some other stuff maybe, you know, that's related to the film um, and it depends you know, depends what kind of strategy. I mean, this is, you know, like actually when we talked before, you asked me, and I think w the way I, both as a filmmaker and as a producer, I always think first is like if, if someone comes with an idea or I have an idea, who will want to see this and why? Mm -hmm. You know, and that to me then determines is this worth making or not? Because there are certain films that, you know, the whole thing doesn't really work, you know, so it works for certain genres and so on. I mean, this film that I mentioned to you that is, um, that we looked in Canada, to shoot is, is that's a heavy drama that actually was written by a psychotherapist about uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and sol that soldiers are having. And the script is fantastic, but it's a really heavy story. So you know that you have to have some really big name actors to play that, otherwise nobody's going to see that film. I mean, this is me thinking as a producer, you know. Um, but it's it's true, you know. So certain films, you know, you have to have certain type of budget or maybe the social media campaign won't really work. But with a film like Zenith, you know, the festivals are really not what's gonna make that film or sell that film because it's, you know, it's a conspiracy, the stuff is very cool, it's very sexy, so we can just go straight ahead with that. But if it's an art house drama, then of course you have to go with the festivals and so on. And then the social media, you know, is, is can help you, you know, it's again, you know, when we did the lore because the story about five women and so on, so we then tried to reach out a lot of women's organizations, you know, uh, because all the stories are very specific to each one of the characters and where they come from and so on, uh, to make them aware of this movie. So, you know, and it's a different thing. You know, we were not pushing something or, but we we're saying, hey, can you look at this? We think that this can be interesting for you. It's not a documentary, but it's based on true stories. Um, and maybe, you know, it's something that you want. And a lot of these organizations that really helped and promoted it and so on. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Yes? Yeah, I knew it. Come on up, Tim. Why is it embarrassing? Okay. All right. <laughs> so, all right. So, Tanya and I are transitioning from the whole actor writer thing into. All right, we're taking our stuff. All right, and we're doing it ourselves. So, where, where would you recommend like we start in terms of the marketing and and that sort of thing? Uh, well, but what kind of stuff are you doing? I mean, genre-wise, or um, it's mine's kind of you know relationship drama kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, sorry about the microphone. Um, some, uh, relationship dramas and thriller. the what? Thriller. thriller. Oh yeah, the thriller. <laughs> okay. She does write great, great thriller. thriller. Well, she does thriller mysteries and she does right. phenomenal work on it. So it, it's just that sort of thing in terms of building the audience and... Uh, have right. you shot it already or are no, you No, we're, no, we're okay. going to be shooting some of it in December. Okay. Um, and it's a feature that you're doing? Well, we're doing just a couple of shorts just mm -hmm. to kind of 
do proof of concept, that kind of right. stuff. I mean, I, w I usually would go with looking at where do people go that like that type of film. So where, is, where, where do people hang out online that like those type of genres of films? So whether it's you know websites, whether it's blogs, whether it's you know uh, any other type of social media, you know, and kind of are introduce they, are them. People or club people? Right. Like right. In, in like yeah. yeah. Right. So you know, and kind of seeing um, the same thing. Like you know, I mean, there there there's like fan groups who like right. you know thrillers or you know, um, and kind of it's really, uh, as I said, for some genres it's easier, of course, to find that. Like if you go, okay, you know, conspiracy guys, you know, that you can find easier. Uh, the broader the genre is, the harder that. that is but you know like relationship issues that's pretty universal you right. know so it's basically everybody's interested in that right and then you have the thriller component so you know I would try to first kind of I mean literally I had one person we had one person doing research and she found there were about th th 3,000 websites dealing with conspiracies in different ways and we contacted all of them Wow. we got only a dozen in the end you know right. who really partnered up with us but that's kind of you know um, that's right working, that's yeah exactly so and there are you know these guys now who you can hire or you know work on a kind of commission basis as your social media producer or, or marketing manager and I think that's really worth it you know because then you can connect it maybe with a Kickstarter campaign right. or something because that's a good way also of building not only raising money but building audiences you know Very good thank you thanks sounds good also, though, too, I think when you when there's someone that you follow online, I mean, not to say that your film is about the same thing that you follow that person, but maybe it is, and maybe that's a good reason to reach out to that person who has mm -hmm. this cult-like following, or or brands. Have you ever done anything with brand integration or anything like that? Um, not really. I mean, the problem with brands is that they are a little hesitant for independence. You know, they're sure. really um, because they're they're more cautious. Sure. It's sure. much harder to do that, you know. The um, there was a was a, the guy who did the Super Size Me. He tried that uh, the documentary um, to actually fund his whole documentary with a sponsorship, and, and it was very hard. Um, mm. So you know, it's it's not something that's that's easily done unless you have a film that's that's very clearly, you know, if you have a baseball movie, you know, that's a family type of film, that's a different story, you know. Yeah. Then of course you can really do like these type of deals. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Or even like, sometimes I think if you have brand integration and maybe they give you um, some sort of sponsorship, but even going a step further and maybe there's some up and coming brand that no one knows about really sure. so much, but they have a huge following themselves and it's a barter type of situation that they're not sponsoring you, but yeah, I you mean, feature them and they post about you. Yeah, the, the thing we did a lot, and this is usually how we get the really low budgets, is to get stuff from company, you know, whether it's like costumes, for example, or technical stuff or whatever, those type of things, you know, food and stuff, so you can sure. actually, where you can save a lot of money and just, you know, put their credits or whatever in the, you know, just yeah. turn the brand to the camera. You know. Absolutely, yeah, cool. So does anyone else have a question before we, we go into, yes, um, I'll dictate again. Thank you. You're welcome. How do you cast your films? Um, it depends, again, you know, sometimes it's either uh, people who, um, now that I've worked with before or someone who I know has worked with them before. Um, you know, and a lot of the actors we work with actually, they're really well known in their countries because a lot of them are, you know, like for example, this guy Didier is a French actor, has been in over 100 movies and, and so, you know, but they don't mean much, of course, here, like nobody knows who they are, but they do mean in terms of festivals and other um, things. Sometimes it's casting directors, of course, you know, that's also depends on the budget of the film. If you have, uh, because if you have a casting director, you have to have a relatively decent budget that you can at least offer them something, you know, um, not just your ultra low budget hundred dollars sack. Uh, Thank fee. you. Thank <laughs> so, you. <laughs> so, you know, but it depends on, you know, uh, I usually the nice, the good thing is if you have a, um, if you can find, you know, for example, Allure, it was interesting because, you know, we had like, um, three actresses that we, that I knew. I haven't worked with them before, but I knew them from before. And then just we did a um, um, casting call and we cast two young actresses who were like for their first uh, feature roles and they were terrific. They're phenomenal. So, yeah. Just from a casting yeah. call. Yeah. 
Well, well no, I mean, on Allure, it wasn't, it was, that was really just a regular, you know, art house feature, you know, so we didn't, you know, but it was kind of the way we did it. It was, you know, again, it was a little different because we shot it over a period of six months on and off. So as long as I knew that all the actors would agree to that, and it was very, it was like there was no budget, really, you know, so we all did it because we really liked the project and, you know, wanted to see how we can work with that. Um, and then the casting process, you know, so for this film, for example, because it's an improvised movie, so what we did is, you know, we set everybody, you know, to, to prepare some, you know, lines to come, and then we, we would videotape the audition, and then, you know, after they would do their monologue or whatever, I, I would tell them, tell us a story. And some of them would just freeze, and others would start telling us, you know, because why, right? Because it's an improvised movie, so if you cannot react in the moment and tell us a story and, and capture it, you know, that means you can't really, because some actors are great in improv, not everybody is, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't mean, you know, some actors can be great, but they need a lot of work. Uh, others can just be in the moment, you know, so, and those are the type of actors we needed for this particular film. Um, so, you know, and then it's also, uh, to me, it's also, I think, in my view, it's also a lot, again, about the look in terms of that, the presence, you know, which means that you can believe that that person is that, you know, actor. And this is one of the advantages, you know, as much as, uh, you know, independent filming has a lot of disadvantages, but the advantages are that you can actually, you know, get the people who you want, you know, because if you're doing a bigger budget, then sometimes you have to do with maybe actors that you personally wouldn't believe are the best choice, you know, but they have to be in the film because of the financing and all that. <laughs> put, it, put it in a nice way, right? It's very diplomatic, <laughs> yes, <Yeah>. very good. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna get into our very end here. I'm going to mm -hmm. ask you a couple th filmmaker or thought leader rapid fire questions. Okay. These are my Oh, are you ready? Uh, okay. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Okay. We'll see. So, I won't I won't be too hard on you. I won't, I promise. <laughs> um so, um finish this sentence, if you will. We need visual storytellers because um because now everything is about visual storytelling. Mm -hmm. So, I think the the more we have really good visual storytellers, the better stories we'll be able to tell each other. Absolutely. It's all about telling each other stories, mm -hmm. connecting. Awesome. Who inspires you? I've got so many people. Um, does it have to be one person? No. <laughs> um, uh, well, I mean, one person who inspired, uh, probably who I learned most from is also I used to work with a DP uh, who was a very famous DP in Yugoslavia, and this was I was his apprentice for two years, and he inspired me uh, because he taught me everything. You know, like film school taught me a lot of stuff, but the real stuff I learned from him, and it was very generous. And one thing that he said, and I repeat this now to my students, is that you cannot judge uh, all films the same way. You know, in other words, uh, you know, as a viewer, you know, I can judge. Uh, I don't know, Batman and some $5,000 independent film and say, I like this, I don't like that. But as a filmmaker, he told me that it's like you always have to respect that someone put something on because this is blood, sweat, and tears and on, on a low budget. If they did it for $200 million, you don't have to go you easy on them. Yeah, anything, but, right? but you know, on the, on the low budget movies, no matter what, you know, the, because you know that the result, there's always, you know, you have to fight so many battles to get it done. So that was inspirational. So, you know, um, in terms of the filmmaking aspect, but there's many, many other people who inspire me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Rade Vladic. Oh, try, try Googling that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Rapid Vladic. Yeah, it's V L A D I C yeah. is his last name, yeah. Awesome. That's fun to say. Um, <clears throat> what do you want your legacy to be? <laughs> <sighs> um, I don't know. Uh, again, you know, a lot of, I mean, I hope. And I already have, you know, some that my students will be the legacy, you know, and I already have some of them being very successful. Um, and it's great. I mean, this is something I never thought would happen to me. So it's the same way that, you know, it's the same like how some people have a very big impact on you. And you're like, be, without this person, like without Rade, I wouldn't, you know, become the same filmmaker. And then when, you know, I have a student who says in his acceptance speech for his award that, I did that for him, it makes me, you know, that's really great. It's, I mean, it sounds cliche, but it's really not. I mean, it's like, it's really, uh, it's really not fake. I think that's, you know, because I now I already look at, they're the, they're the next visual storytellers, you know? Yes, absolutely, mm. yeah. yes. And I, I totally relate to that. Because it is, it is about helping others 
get their yeah. vision out into the world. And when you do that, you, you have a part of that. And that's a beautiful thing. I mean, to me, that's like, you know, if you have the passion to do it, I want to, you know, I want to help you. And I think this yeah. is what, you know, like a lot of these people, especially in the independent film world, you know, this is, you know, this is why we're doing this. It's not just because, you know, because it's certainly not because of the money. Yes. <laughs> I know it's certainly not. Um, so where can we find out more about you online? Where can we follow you? Um, well, my company name is Surla Films. Uh, so it's our website. There's a blog. Um, you know, we have a Facebook page and all that. I have to admit that although we do all this stuff with social media and stuff for each project, I'm not one of those that posts my own stuff, you know, yeah, but yeah. for the projects we, we do. But this is usually um, information we post like on, on uh, the Facebook page and Surla Films. Cool. cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This thank has you. been thank highly you. informative. Thank and you. I hope. Really appreciate yeah. you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Oh.